Welcome back to the last episode of the crossover with Joe R. Lucas before this year's Final Four in Cologne, Germany, that starts on the 28th of May. And we're fortunate enough for the next hour to have someone on our podcast that'll be there with me, but he's just gonna have a little bit of a tad bit better role than I will have. The big man from Barcelona who's made his way through Europe, performed great no matter where he's been. This will be his second Final Four as he also found his way there playing for the same coach that he has now, but on a different team. That was Argiris Kaunas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the crossover, Mr. Brandon Davies. What's up, my man? How's the family doing? Everything good? Hello. Yeah, everything's good. All good. Good. Man, I got to ask you the first question, man. Am I the only commentator that constantly slips up and calls you Brandon Davis? <laughs> no, I mean, that's been happening my whole career. So. <laughs> good, man, because I've, yeah. I've been feeling bad about myself. I'm like, man, every time like there's a fast play or an alley-oop or a dunk, I'm like, Brandon Davis. I'm like, Shh, it's Davies, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all good. I, I don't mind too much. It's it's uh, my mom who gets offended a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that, but that's why I, I, I capitalized her name in, in that part of the interview. I said, at least I'm going to have another chance to call you Davis for a couple more games at the end of, the, <laughs> the end of this month. So, hey, let's get started, man. We'll talk about the Final Four later. Tell me about this super mom that you call her, Linda Kathleen Davies. Um, yeah, my my mom's amazing. You know, there's not there's, I could talk about her, you know, all day, and you know, just the little things that she's done for me and continues mm -hmm. to do for me. You, you call her super mom. It's just because of just everything. Just she's been able to, to take care of you from day one. Yeah, I mean, raising three kids on your on your own isn't you know isn't easy. So. Um, you know, especially um, when one of them's like me. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a taste of uh, my own medicine now with, with my kids. You know, they, they act just like, like how I acted when I was a kid and make it kind of hard on, on me and mom. But um, what, what, what comes around goes around, my man. Exactly. <laughs> you know that. I love this job because I get to know you guys and, and, and learn so much about you off the court. I didn't know that like you were born in Philadelphia and then two days later your mom adopted you and brought you to Utah I mean I have a I have an adopted son we adopted him from Ethiopia about 13 he was 13 months old it's not like you know because you're adopted so young it's not like you're really adopted is it it's just it's just your family that's all it is no yeah I mean it's you grow up and that's that's the normal you know it's it's to me uh growing up you know it was kind of I guess it was weird in a sense when um, people like were having kids of their own, like, Oh, you're not adopted. Like it's uh, not everyone was adopted, you know? So that, <laughs> that was just the, that was just the norm. And you just, you know, you, when you learn more about it, as you get older, uh, you just um, kind of learn more about the, the love that goes into it and the importance mm. of it. It's amazing, man. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, my, my, my wife, well, the, my mm. child's mom, not my ex-wife, brought it to me a long time ago. And I wasn't sure I was able to do it yet because I already had two biological children, but, um, but it, it's just like, it's just, an, it's just another kid. It's, it's, it's your kid, you know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. To love. And it's a little bit more special also, especially when your biological ones, like you said, are, they're not as good as, they're not as good as my other one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I met you in Belgrade the first time. And and I remember taking two things in the meeting. One is like, I'm like, damn, this guy's cool, man. I mean, this guy's just, he's tight. He's a good guy. And I remember the shoes you had on, man. Like, the, you had like, I don't even know that if there were sneaks or shoes or whatever. We had the award ceremony. And I think I came up and said something to you, man. And like a couple of weeks later, I tried to go out and buy me a pair of kicks like that. <laughs> and, and my wife was like, you're 50 years old, man. Quit trying to, <laughs> quit trying to be young. And now, and now look at you with the new hairdo and everything. Yeah, I mean, if I remember right, it was, I think it was like some all black, there, um, some spikes there. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, red bottoms, I think. So it was, uh, they're, they're one of those shoes that you can only wear for certain events, you know. <laughs> so, uh, that was definitely one of them. Yeah, well. I didn't. I didn't go out and get the ones with the spikes on, but still, I think I wore. <laughs> I think I wore them once, and I and I put them away for good. <laughs> looking into your past, man, we were like all star baseball player. I was looking at. I was like all star tight end. He had to be something like that. But you were soccer, like you were like. Yeah, I mean, when, well, growing up when I was a kid, all my friends around me and 
in my neighborhood, they all played soccer. And in I was kind of in Utah, soccer was that big? Yeah, I mean, I, at least in amongst my group of friends and everything. I mean, they we all played like every sport. You know, I played one year of baseball, wasn't for me. One year of football, wasn't for me. Uh, I was playing soccer. I was like the same size as all my friends, and you know, just a little faster, a little more athletic. And then I started hitting the growth spurt. Knees started buckling. <laughs> so I needed to find something else that I could use my height with. And uh, once they moved me to goalie in soccer and I was sitting there bored in, in the goal, and <laughs> I was like, I need a new sport. So that's when my love for basketball started. Yeah, but those goalies get paid a lot of money right now to get to they do. I, and get bored. I regret it now. Yeah, I regret <laughs> it now. I wish I would have stuck with it. <laughs> Especially, and now, look, how ironic is it that you're on one of the big – you're playing basketball for one of the biggest football clubs in the world. How, I mean, how crazy is that? Yeah, I mean, it's and then just to see the, you know, the lifestyle of, like, you know, some of the soccer players and then how much love and that the fans have for them is – uh, unbelievable here. Uh, well, you ain't doing so bad yourself, man. You, you're not doing so bad. I, I always ask people this question because I played, you know, baseball, basketball. I played a little bit of everything growing up. How much do you think being on a soccer pitch, it, it, a field for for the Americans that don't understand what a pitch is, how, how much do you think that it helped you, like footwork wise and, and ability wise, to be on the basketball court? Um, I think it helped a lot, especially, you know, coordination wise. And um, but I think that's what, what's important, you know, as a kid to try multiple sports. You know, you got to find uh, my mom, you know, didn't force me to do just one thing. She just wanted me out playing. And, um, you know, you, you build a love, you build, a you know, coordination, footwork, things like that. And um, even just the competitive nature of it, you know, and um, I think a lot of um uh, you know, not just footwork in soccer, but like stamina, you know, you're, you're running the whole time, you know? So um, I think those were things that helped build who the athlete I am today. And, and when did, when did you make the decision? Just like, I got, this is, I'm, I'm done. I got to go basketball. This is, cause you didn't even mention basketball to me yet. You haven't even said that you played basketball. You said you played other sports. Yeah. So I didn't really start getting into basketball until, you know, like sixth, seventh grade. I, I played, it was called junior jazz. But, uh, you know, I was, wasn't very good. You know, I only played a little bit of minutes because I was paying to be on the team. And, um, you know, then uh, as my skills developed, I started growing into my body. I started, you know, figuring things out, um, you know, kind of a Michael Jordan type story, like got right. cut from the, um, seventh grade team made the b team all my best friends were on the a team so uh really put in the work that summer and you know things just came along after that and each year in high school grew i grew about two inches every year from seventh grade to uh 12th grade so that's kind of when um i knew things were getting serious with basketball I said that that's I think that's a fortunate thing because I felt like that happened. I saw so many of my friends grow like a foot during the summer, you know what I mean? Or almost a, a half a foot or, or 12, 10 inches. I did the same thing. I grew like four summers in a row. I grew, grew like three inches. And I think it was it was fortunate because you didn't get that uncoordinated, like you know, you know that right. big the big guy that just like kind of like walks around and hasn't like you said, hasn't caught up to himself yet. Yeah, and I, I, there was a spurt where, you know, my my knees were just aching, you know, for a year, you know, you're, right. you get the Osgood Slaughters or whatever they're called, and um, just knee pain, growing pains, you know, that was, that part was miserable, but you kind of figure it out as you go. So you were brought up in Utah, the Church of the Latter-day Saints, and, and was BYU the, was, was you know, once you got recruited, were you recruited by the schools, or was just, was BYU going to be your choice? Um, no, I I was, uh, when I narrowed it down, I got quite a bit of, you know, offers. And obviously, a lot of the local schools, Utah State, U University mm -hmm. of Utah. Uh, but I had some offers from, uh, like, Gonzaga, Cal Berkeley, um, and BYU were my top three. And um, then I, I just went on visits to, to Berkeley, went on visits to Gonzaga. And, um, you know, a lot of my, obviously, my friends were going to BYU and, uh, it just came down to, you know, being close to mom and being right. able to help out with the bills and things like that. So um, that was ultimately my choice to go there. A college, a college kid being able to help out with the bills? Were you, were you working too? <laughs> well, you know, I, I got a full ride scholarship. And then when right. you get to live at home, you get to 
um, use some of that to help out. So, oh, there you go. Um, yeah. yeah, I was fortunate, but I did also, you know, work a little bit. Um, one of my best friends at a has a family restaurant in Utah, so um, called Sweets Island Grill that I always there you go. Uh, get, that, work at, get them so. in, get, look, get some pub in for Sweets Island Grill. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I always talk about those four years of college with man. It's it's they're so hard, man. They're so difficult. The practicing, the studying, the responsibilities, the, I mean, and then you got, I, I don't want to call them regular students, but the non-scholarship students that are looking at us like, man, you guys are spoiled because every now and then you get to, you know, they get to register for classes early or whatever, but nobody knows what it's like, man, to be practicing in the morning, going to class, practicing in the afternoon, going to class, traveling, having to study on the road, having to come back and take a test. It develops you into a person that, that is just ready for life when you're when you when you leave. I mean, do you yeah. feel like that's what you went through at Utah at BYU? I should say. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a, a grind. You know, no one. I mean, I shouldn't say no one, but there's a lot of athletes who you know they're. We try to have our main focus be basketball, but I mean, they every major university is you know you're a student athlete, so you they push the the homework and studies and everything first. And, um, but I mean, there's a lot of guys who are just doing the student part just so they can play basketball, you know, like there's, um, but that's, that's what kind of makes it hard is you, you can't fully invest into just basketball. Like people think you are, you know, right. you, you still, you still got to do your, your homework most of the time too. Yeah, I, I'm, I went to Niagara University, which is way on the other side of the world for you. But I'm assuming that BYU was somewhat like what Lake Niagara. They weren't they weren't letting us just walk through classes. You had to like actually study and pass. Yeah, I mean, we had you know mandatory like study hall. We had tutors. Right. We had you know the uh, coaches checking classes, make sure you're there. You know, and a lot of punishments for not reaching those things. So I mean, no one wants to run extra and. <laughs> I think we had some things where uh, if anyone missed class, the whole team had to had to run. So it was oh, one of those man. things that you, you got to make sure <laughs> you get it done for your teammates. We used to do that. The person that missed class used to have to sit down and watch the team run class, run, run sprints. <laughs> it's like, you mean, yeah, it, made you, it, it made you feel worse. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the worst feeling in the world. You know, I can, you can, uh, you know, Punish me, all, you know, for my stuff. But right. when you got kids, kids involved, it, it, it hits different. Yeah, I remember the first time I had to sit down and see that. I'm like, oh, man, I'll never do make that mistake again. But, <laughs> hey, uh, we, I mean, everybody goes through some tough times. You had a rough patch your sophomore season. I love to talk about people when they go through something mm -hmm. and then come back from it. You were suspended for a violation from BYU. BYU is a, a, a tough school. I mean, it's a Brigham Young University. I mean, they have their own rules. They have their own philosophies. They have their own conduct. You didn't do anything criminal. You didn't do anything. There's no NCAA violation, but you were suspended for that year. How, how difficult, almost what we were just talking about, how difficult is it for you to sit out? Because your team depended on you that sophomore year a pretty a pretty good amount, much more than your freshman year. How difficult was that time for you to, to sit out and have to serve that violation? Yeah, I mean, that was the, the hardest part, you know, of – uh, you know, of my life, you know, this is, you're talking about a kid who's, you know, every, all I know was basketball and, you know, like that was, you know, kind of taken away from me for, um, you know, my actions and, you know, I signed, I signed something and I didn't stick to it. So that's like a lesson, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that'll always stick with me. And, um, you know, but the main part for me was just the, the growing up factor. You know, I knew I was a big part of the team, you know, but, my teammates were nothing but encouraging to do what help me do what I need to do to get back or or to make things right. You know, like they as great of a season we had or would have had with me. Uh, you know, that's one thing I'll never forget is the the brotherhood of our uh, and chemistry of our team. That you know they they stood behind me no matter what. You know, including our coaches and staff. But um, you know I, that was one of those times where you know I was out of school I didn't have my scholarship anymore I had to go get a job I had to um, do everything I needed to within um, you know ecclesiastically so which means like through the church and everything mm -hmm. so um, to try to do my best to get reinstated so I had a lot of growing up to do um, pretty fast you know among 
the all the other things that were involved with the situation. So, um, but I, you know, I wouldn't. I, I could have turned and, you know, went to a different school and things like that. But, you know, I felt like, you know, it's, I wanted to return and, you know, do things the right way and, um, you know, pick up where I, where I left off and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, it was a valuable lesson that I, I, I had to learn and uh, you just have to face the music sometimes and when things get hard. Man, that, that I hear you as Brandon Davies, but that sounds like, Miss D Miss Davies coming through too, man. I, I I think she had that speech with you too, didn't she? At that time. Uh, I mean, well, she, my my wife's incredible. You know, she knew everything that. Oh was no, I'm talking about your team. mom. I'm talking about your mom. Oh, that was the hardest part was having. Yeah. The, you can imagine <laughs> that conversation. Uh, right. You know, going home and, um, you know, saying, "Mom, I I I'm suspended." So I mean, that was the that was the hardest part. Um, to be honest, was telling her but she had nothing but love and say all right let's we get through this let's get let's do what we need to do so um she was with me every step of the way my my favorite part is the comeback well i mean tell me about like you went through the whole church thing you you, you did everything you needed to do to come back to get over the this this code of conduct failure whatever and, and you come back and you start practicing and playing your junior senior year man huh i mean What's that feel as a, as a as a young man? I mean, because one thing is that you're out for an injury, you know what I mean, and, and you got hurt. Another thing is you put it upon yourself, you know, and you come back. What's what's that feeling like to be back man, and, and be with your teammates again, and 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 be able to go home and tell your mom like I did everything I need to do, and I'm back, mom. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of the sense of you know you feel like you accomplished something as a man and um, as a person. You know, you you feel. It, you know, it wasn't easy. It took, you know, it was a, a long road. It felt like, you know, a lifetime to, um, you know, especially having to sit on sit on the side and watch my teammates and, and you know, just you definitely feel where you, where you're missed and where you could help. And, you know, that's, and when you lose a game, it's, you feel like it's your fault, even though you're not right. playing or practicing, but um, just going through like that adversity and then, um, you know, I didn't, I never forgot a moment. I never forgot a, um, you know, a game. I still remember losing in the sweet 16, the Florida, you know, sitting there on the bench, you know, in tears and, um, you know, but my teammates, they lost too. And they came oh. and to me and hugged me, made sure I was good, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. but anyways, going through that and, uh, once you're back on the court, you you feel you play with a little more chip on your shoulder, like you know, like you, all right, I got to be better than I was, you know, not just as a basketball player, but as a man, and you really feel like you, you know, did something great. Do, do you appreciate the game more? Yeah, for being sure. away from it. Yeah, when it's it can be taken away, you know, at, at any moment, you know, due to injury or you know, in college, like my situation, but. Um, but I, I think after that point, it was, you know, it was go time for me to where I like fully invested in like, okay, if this, I'm going to do whatever I can to play this game. So if that means going to class, going to school. Okay. I'll, I'm going to, I'll do that to play. And then on the court, I saw how my teammates were for me, like, okay, I'm going to do whatever I can for my teammates, every possession, you know, every play. And, um, I think that that's kind of, um, I've, I've definitely carried that with me. You know, I, I take a lot of pride in being that guy and being there for my teammates, even, even now as I, as I continue to play. Yeah. We, I mean, we, start, I think we all see that in you ever since I've first seen you play in Zagreb that's, that's, there's, I don't think that there's any doubt about that whatsoever, <laughs> but my next, my next question is when was, when was the first time that you could remember in your mind where maybe you laid down and closed your eyes at night to go to sleep or, or you're hooping, you know, at BYU or whatever, where, where it popped into your head where the NBA might have become a dream of yours or might have become like something you were – you were. Um, that was that was uh, my junior year in, uh, in college. Like when I – when you know, when I really had to sit down and look at my life and like, All right, what do I want to do? And mm -hmm. that's – I decided that – I was going to go, I was going to be a professional. I was going to go to the NBA and play as a professional as long as I could. And, um, you know, I, it, that, that was always like a life, you know, a, 
you dream as a kid, you know, everyone wants to has those dreams or whatever, but it was really that moment, you know, in college and, um, you know, putting in the extra work and seeing the, um, you know, seeing the results of that and getting better every single year in college. And that was like, you know, like I'm a pro, I'm going to get there. What was it a disappointment to you to go undrafted 2013? Uh, I think initially, you know, I was one of those guys who, um, you know, I didn't have a huge get together, but like, you know, there was my agent told me, you know, there's, we spoke about some things here and there. He was really open with me as I was with the BDA at the time, Bill Duffy. And Mm -hmm. um, we had an open conversation about, you know, if this team takes you here, you know, there's a lot of talk about maybe like a draft and stash, I think they call it, where they draft you, but stick you overseas. And then you have no control of, you know, your destiny. So uh, I think they they did things, you know, the right way because as soon as the draft ended, I had a deal um, with the Clippers. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, you know, unfortunate. You want that, you know, you want that party and your name called and all that. But <laughs> at the end of the day, it, it worked out for me. I tell everybody the same thing. I got my name called in the fourth round. That was back when there was like 13 rounds. So that, that doesn't even <laughs> count nowadays, man. <laughs> No, but there also there's there's a lot of guys, and I still you know I still carry that kind of in my on my shoulder a little bit. There's a lot of guys who um, in the league who are still playing, but there's a lot of guys who were drafted who haven't played a single minute. So right. um, it's you can kind of look at it and, and see it, you know the meaning behind it. I mean, you know, how life is. There's always gonna be someone doing better than you. Always gonna be someone doing worse than you. Man. Just just, just <laughs> exactly. keep your keep your path. That's all that really matters. Right. You got you got caught up in the in the business part of the NBA, you know, where where you were moved from from the Clippers to the Sixers. And interesting, I mean, Philly, how cool was that? Was it cool to you? Like you were born in Philadelphia originally and you went back? Yeah, that was definitely there? cool. Yeah, it was definitely cool. Cool experience. I, I visited before. Uh, my mom has, has taken me back, you know, to see, um, you know, just to be around the area and be around, you know, the – my people so to speak so um it's I was there a couple times prior and then to go back as a player it was kind of you know surreal to me you know but um you know you kind of appreciate it more when you're older you know not as much when you're younger and then you got moved around and and, uh, typical get released before the January 10th deadline of guaranteed contract same thing happened to me the only my dad my deadline when I played was December 15th it was a month earlier and Oh, I'll, ne- I'll never forget uh, telling you, know, don't answer the phone. Don't talk to anybody. <laughs> you get yeah. that. I, I don't know. I don't know about you, but I got the call. I don't know if you got called in, but how hard was that to like, because, you know, when, when I asked you about the dream before, when I talk to kids a lot now, I talk to them about the dream. I'm always trying to make them realize that the dream is, you know, the dream is beautiful, but there's a lot of shit that goes with the dream, man. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you, so, you know, sure. you, you, when you're dreaming or you're back in, in Provo in Utah you, and you laid out a night thinking about being in the NBA, you ain't, you're not worried about being traded from one team to another, not playing, sitting on the bench, and then getting cut on January 10th. Yeah. What's, what's that part of the dream all about? So the, the biggest thing for me was I remember signing with the Clippers, getting there, practicing. And my first day, um, I walk in the gym. We have one-on-ones with the bigs. And I'm there with uh, Blake Griffin's in the gym, DeAndre Jordan, um, uh, Humphreys was there, just like summer workouts. That's where everyone goes. And it's just like dunk <laughs> after dunk after dunk. And it's like you you stay on defense till you get a stop. So it's like, I'm just like, oh, my gosh. I remember calling my mom after that and be like, oh, my gosh, this is, this is different. They jump higher in person than they do on TV. But – Anyways, they were, they were great guys. But uh, for me, the part of the dream, you think of, you know, I, I get my first uh, check from the Clippers and I'm looking at it and I'm I'm seeing the, the taxes taken away and I'm like calling my mom. Am I reading this right? <laughs> you know, that was the, the funniest part. Like, oh, they didn't tell me about taxes in college. They didn't tell <laughs> me about- they're taking half. <laughs> Come on, you didn't you didn't take an accounting class in college? No, no, I, I did, but it, it hits, we just it didn't pay attention to you, it. Yeah, I never got the a real check, and that point it was I've, it hit my stomach a little bit. 
Hey, I made the same call to my dad and my dad, it was, he was just a, I mean, my dad worked like four different jobs. You know what I mean? My dad, he said, son, with the amount of money you just got paid, don't bitch about paying taxes. Yeah, Shut yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I got told, but. Yeah. Oh, but he, the, the, yeah, the, the business, the business side of it was for me, it was kind of surreal because, you know, going to, from the Clippers, seeing their facilities and, you know, and then uh, getting moved to the Sixers and they're in the middle of a, uh, you know the they called it the process or whatever and there, 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 was, there was a two-year process for about 10 years yeah and i <laughs> i signed a, a four-year non-guaranteed deal with them so every day was a tryout for me right and you know they don't tell you about that and so i was always the you know the, i was the 15th man who you know clawing to makes myself worth something I had about had three games in a row where i had you know really good numbers you dropped just traded. 20, you, had, you dropped 20 in one game yeah, I had 13, I think 15, and 20. And then Sam Hinkie calls me and says, thanks for your services. Thanks. So, <laughs> but then I was, I was supposed to start that game. I'll never forget, we were in Atlanta. And I was, this was supposed to be my fifth game in a row starting. And uh, they, they, I'm going to warm up. They bring me back in. They say, uh, uh, you can't play tonight because the trade deadline is tomorrow and you're being traded to Brooklyn, so I can't play. I fly with the team. We had a back-to-back -to, -back to Brooklyn. I fly with the team to Brooklyn. And they they dropped out. me off in a different hotel. I'm dressed up in a Nets gear playing against Philly. <laughs> that's crazy. So that's the business side of it. <laughs> I, I was, we played, we played against Atlanta in Sacramento, and, and one of the players from Atlanta, Mike McGee, they picked up right after the game. So they called me at 11 o'clock at night to tell me not to bother coming to practice tomorrow. I'm off the team, Mike <laughs> McGee's on the team. It's, it's all nuts, man. It's just yeah, crazy. Man. Um, you came to Europe, France, Italy, then back to France again. I'm gonna try to skip over that because you don't have much time and you gotta practice for the final four. But my boys in London, who did a lot of the research for me, you met him when you jumped on it earlier, told me that, that Saris, Saris convinced you to go to Kaunas in a phone call or something. What, what, is, is, that, is that true? Or is that something, usually that goes through the, an agent? Um, yeah, I mean, it definitely goes through the agent, but you know, he wanted to speak with me personally. Um, mm. You know, he wanted to um, stress that he likes players who are, you know, who are hungry and, um, you know, who, who, can prove, you know, prove their, prove their worth and who are looking to um, get better and help the team win, you know? So, um, and he doesn't, at that time, you know, is in Kaunas, he doesn't bring just anyone there, you know, he wants to, he goes through a lot of, uh, uh, and he goes through a process to when he's recruiting players to go there. And, um, you know, and my first year there, we, you know, kind of bunked heads a little bit, but, you know, as we've grown and our relationship has grown, uh, things are, I wouldn't say easier, but you know we we understand each other a little more, so uh, makes makes life better. You and I both got that smile, like we know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I I get into that in a second, but you had a great year, man, and that was a great season for for the team. Um, I, I always look at this all good as like it's everybody's favorite team. You know what I mean? You just can't help but to be a fan because. Number one, it's such a class organization. Number two, it's always everything just seems so clean and, and perfect. And, and number three is is they just have like I said, like kind of like what you have that blue collar, that hard worker mentality. And and you guys that year, I mean, went eighteen and twelve, I think, and and then played Olympiacos, and I want to say you guys beat Olympiacos, but you actually dominated Olympiacos in the playoffs. Man, which, <laughs> I mean it just had to be crazy to be there your first year with those fans and, and, and the way that city is about their basketball. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable place to, to play, you know, they're not, not just their facilities and organization, like you said, but um, you know, they're the, the fans there are, are incredible. You know, it feels like basketball is, you know, all they got and they pour their heart and soul into you. If you're a player and um, it's, you know, un unforgettable experience, you know, to be a part of that. And especially to be rolling how we were rolling and uh, playing in, in front of sellout crowds every game. And a lot of their crowd, a lot of our fans were traveling to our road games. So we had support everywhere. And uh, it was just nice to see, you know, when you're in a hostile environment, you look up and you see 
all the green shirts, you know, right there yeah. with you. So you you had a great playoff series. You had what twenty one, I think, in game one, twenty in game two, another eighteen in game three, and and during that playoff run, and, and you get to the final four, and, and when you have a club like that, that that they just die to get to a final four or, or you know what I mean? It's, is it hard for you to personally enjoy that victory because you're enjoying it with everybody else around you? I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but it's like, it's like, I feel like if, if, if well, right now you're, you're going to the final four, it's not the same when Barcelona goes to the final four, when Zelgir does this. So you don't personally yeah. enjoy it as much. You're like, man, you're just, everybody's enjoying it all around you. You're just like hugging everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 yeah and, it was for me one of the things that sticks to my mind the most when I think about it is just the I think we had to win eight in a row just to just to qualify for the playoffs. That and that then, was the that was the second year. That was oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. was the next year. Because my question to you was oh, talking, okay. Yeah, my question to you was what was more fun going to the final four and beating Cheska or actually making that seven or eight game run where you guys beat Real uh, okay. Madrid in, in the end of the se- the last game of the season to no, get yeah, back into the playoffs. Getting to the final four like that and, you know, which, winning the winning one of the – obviously you wanted to win two games, but, you know, winning the game there, taking third, you know, that's you, – you felt like you won. Like the way – It was great. You felt like you won the championship, you know, going great, back. Man. It was such an accomplishment. It was like a dream, you know. It was – um, and then going back and we land and there's a parade for us. There's, you know, there's, it's just unforgettable. You know, it's I, hard I, to put I, into words. I didn't commentate that game. So my role was to go down there and, and, you know, do the questions after the game, you know, in the, in the back room. And, and I could just remember, I was just, I was so happy that I didn't have to commentate that game. That I, I felt like I was there enjoying it with you guys. I'm like, man, I'm, and I look back, I'm like, is there still a championship game? Because I thought they just won the championship. No, yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It, it was, it, it was an awesome experience there, man. And, and then what, what going there the first time, what was it like for you? The, uh, I mean, I know it's your first time in Euro league, first time in final four. What was the preparation like? Practice is more intense. Were people more focused? And yeah, I think um, practices, if I remember right, it wasn't the like the intensity factor of them. It was just the more of you're thinking about everything, you know, every step of the way. You know, every every screen, every little detail is is heightened, and not just your offense, but uh, especially a team like like we were, Zalgiris. Like we had to. You, you don't have a choice but to memorize every single player's tendencies, memorize every single one of their plays, um, who likes to, uh, who likes to do what, you know, it's, you're, you're so focused and studying and cause you, um, on a team like Zalgiris, you, anything will give us, give you, uh, you know, something, give you an edge, give you, you know, so, but th- that's something that's kind of, um, you know, that came from you know, our head coach, you know, his attention to detail is, and what he demands from us is, is kind of what, uh, pushed that and push that, that pushes me to the next level as well. All, all this, all the good stuff, even while you're in Zagiris, I, I, I read that you had a big game, 21 points, eight rebounds, but you had something that you received something else that same night after the Budenos game. Right. Then, then your son pop. Then your son pop into your life at like one o'clock in the morning after you balled out and got MVP of the week. No, week. this this was the night before. He is. Oh, he, it was the night came. before. He, yeah, he came, yeah, yeah. And you still balled out. Yeah, I was. I was, I was up all night. She was. You know, she was pushing. You didn't come until two. Obviously, you're not going to sleep. When, you know, when you have a fresh baby there, you know, you're with the excitement and everything. So, what's his uh, name? How do you say his name? Uh, Case. Case, oh yeah, you're like Case. Come on, man, I got a game tomorrow. <laughs> no, yeah, it's but it was, I guess, you know, just kind of going off that adrenaline from an excitement, kind of, you know, carried over in, into the game, you know. But I, I remember being dead and cramping up and ready to pass out after the game. But you know, it's one of those games I'll never forget, and hopefully he'll he'll remember it too. <laughs> there you go, man. 
all that good stuff going on in counters, man. And and now I, I also read that you got a phone call from Nacho Rodriguez, right? The, from Barcelona. And and, mm-hmm. and you decided to pick up and leave counters and go to Barcelona after all that good stuff. And, and it, I'm getting the fact that like, all you gotta do is make a phone call to Brandon Davies and he might just come play for you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you that well, easy I mean, to be it's... convinced or what? <laughs> no, I mean, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, went into that move, you know, obviously if, if it wasn't, um, you know, the best thing for my family, I could stay in, you know, Zagreus forever. You know, I think, uh, you know, at some point, you know, be maybe even be back there. So, um, you know, oh, I love oh, that, oh, oh, love oh. that town, love that city. So break it, break the uh, news here at the crossover. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it was to me moving the the move to Barcelona was you know the next step in you know my career and I you know as I continue to uh, to grow as a player you know just trying to get better trying to get play the highest level possible all right not at the crossover we have to be a little bit honest so uh, not a little bit i'm going to be extremely honest <coughs> Wait, you had a good season corona hit everything gets shut down obviously then when did the rumors the well when did, i want to know there had to be there always was rumors around Sardes going to barcelona to coach there was a couple of years where everybody thought he was going to go he didn't go and now you're there in the conversation we just had before about eh, a little miscommunication between the two of you. When those rumors, <laughs> when those rumors started that he was coming to coach in Barcelona this season, were you like, oh no, man? <laughs> or, or was everything cool? No, I mean it's obviously it's I have a lot of you know respect from him for him. You know, we have now, you know, we have a really we have a really good relationship, you know, and on and off the court, you know, I can honestly say. Um, um but he was a big part of helping me get to this point in my career, you know? And so there, I didn't have any, uh, anything but excitement, you know, and I've heard um, he was possibly coming here. And, and this was, I, I had a conversation with him about coming here um, about before I even signed here, you know, just cause he obviously knows a lot about Barcelona and everything and uh, gave me a lot of insight and, you know, just, details like that so and and there i mean there had to be a little bit of like man the practices man the way he yells during in the game i mean he's because I mean, he's a tough coach man i've, I've dealt with i dealt with with obradovich when i played in madrid and and those guys those guys can be rough sometimes man but i mean they they turn you into man they, they make you realize that you have to work hard to be successful that's what i think Shelko did for me mostly and um but man, when when you know they're coming, it's like, oh man. <laughs> it, yeah. But it's for at that point in the season, you know, I mean, uh, Pesic was, you know, he's a good coach and he's a pretty hard coach as well. Right. Um, but just the I kind of knew what I had coming for me with Sars coming. You know, I right. kinda so I mm-hmm. I was at a, a little bit of an advantage, you know, than you know, some of my teammates. So I was able to like drop a little knowledge on them about what to expect, but at the end of the day, it just came down to, you know, what's going to get us over this hump, like to win, you know, we want right. to win and, um, you know, having SARS come, you know, he's, he's a winner and yeah, it's not at times it's not, it's not going to be easy, but you know, with his, um, you know, with his basketball mind and everything, it's, um, if bringing him here is going to get us that championship, then let's go. Let's, let's get it. Well, you're almost there, man, but, but, Tell me how. Tell me how nervous things were, and how. I mean, you can tell me it's calm. It, you can tell me all that stuff you want about everything was calm, everything was cool. But when you finish the season twenty four and ten, face the eighth place team in Zenit, and you're down one nothing, and you go into overtime in game two, don't tell me things were calm, man. Come on, y'all were a little bit nervous, weren't you? Go, think about going back to Russia down two zero. <laughs> no, but I mean honestly, I mean that's being hit in the mouth like that is, you know, something that I think is going to help us uh, get to where we need to get, you know. Uh, but, you know, the, our coaches, they tried to, you know, prepare us for for this, you know, type of battle. And, um, you know, at the time, you know, we, we weren't ready. You know, we had to – we learned a lot about ourselves from that series individually and, you know, as a team. But um, you, so you got to give them, you know, a lot of, a lot of credit and – um, you know, especially, but honestly, with without the COVID situation and everything, then it doesn't fall into eighth right. position. You know, right. like they exactly. had, they hit some stuff too. You know, so 
Yeah. But I mean, I honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. It was we needed to we needed to go through that. But before Game Five, it, and I think it's probably the, at least the second time that I've seen this season that 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 your coach officially spoke about his inability to understand that his team doesn't come into games motivated or they don't start games in the right way. Sometimes they, they seem unmotivated. He didn't understand it. He was vo pretty vocal about that before Game Five, also. What what is that? Is there is that a is that a is, is that a chronic thing? Is that something contagious within the locker room? What I mean, or, or is, is, has that been straightened out? Um, you know, I th I think we've we've straightened that out. I mean, like I said, I think that's one of the things we learned from this series. You know, is you know taking every opponent seriously, every game seriously. You know, and but him saying that, you know, he's not just talking about um, you know our Euro League games or playoff games. You know, like there was. Um, times and you know every team has a time where they're even in their domestic leagues where they're playing a team and you know you can kind of be a little bit disinterested at times you know um but that's that's the message that he was trying to get to us is that you know that's what championship teams do you know they take every game seriously they handle business uh the right way and you know everyone's happy you know but um so it's from from start to finish you got you still got a job to do no matter the opponent and um, so that's something that we got to keep you, keep getting better at. You had another big playoff series. Yeah, it started out with 18. You just come to show up in the playoffs, 22 in game two and <laughs> game three. I won't I won't bring up game four because I, I don't want to talk about your stats in game four. But <laughs> but but you, you still showed up. You should showed up and balled out in playoffs. You just like you you like that moment. You just get extra motivated for that moment. Or I mean, it does it's a different game when it's a playoff and you know, it's do or die. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had, uh, um, a lot of, I guess the, I'm really good friends with a guy named Nick Cantor Medley and, you know, he's, yeah, he's kind of, Nick. yeah, he's kind of been a mentor for me. You know, I call him after, you know, bad games sometimes and things like that. He was with me in Monaco. And, you know, one thing that he told me that, you know, that I've never, I'll never forget is just that, you know, that's, no one remembers how you started the season. It's how you finish. So when it's mm -hmm. it's playoff time, you got to – that's when it's showtime. So, um, you know, it's – obviously you try to play the best of your abilities all season long and, um, you know, you got to fight through adversity here and there. But um, really when it's – when it comes to the end of the season, that's, that's grind time. And that's whether you're trying to get a championship or trying to get your next contract. Like that's when all eyes are on. You're you're back in the final four now. Same coach, obviously a different team. What else is going to be different for you this time around? Are you going to approach it differently, or or the same mentality? Um, yeah, I think um, honestly, like we just it's going to just take attention to detail. You know, because some of the things that I learned from the final four, and um, uh, that starts with our coaches and coaching staff. You know, they with their their scouting reports, their practices, and everything like that. It's um, you know, it's but hopefully, um, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one in this, you know, it's going to our type of team when everyone's playing well is when we're at our best. You know, we're we're a lot better team than when just certain individuals are playing well. So uh, I think that's the key for us is everyone uh, being prepared to contribute and, uh, you know, uh, given playing their playing their best game. One thing that one thing that's different is you got another addition to the family too, right? Someone named Enzo Tweed Davies. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, man! That just happened like a month ago, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, he's five weeks I think today. Five weeks old. Yeah. Tweed's like a small town in in Galicia. I used to have a camp there. Where, where did you get that name from? It's uh, it's short for uh, you know, my my best friend. He he passed away uh, last month. Uh, his Last name was, month, yeah. His his name is Damn. Tui Halenye. Um, he was so it's just short for for his name. So, damn that I mean, that must have been rough then. So you 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 named your child. You, the middle name was after your your boy. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. Hey, I always say the same thing, to everybody, man. As we got to kind of wrap this up. We got to finish the the personality thing and then the trivia question real quick. I'll get you out of here. But every Final Four, man, you know this. I don't have to tell you. You got to play it like it's your last one, man. You mm -hmm. never know. You never know. I have a feeling you're going to be back sometime or another. But 
make yeah. sure you play it like it's your last one. Right, right. Let's let's get into this uh, uh, quick little personal thing. I'm gonna ask you quick questions, just one one word answers. Whatever you got for me is perfect for me. You get a free round trip ticket to anywhere in the world. What's your destination? Hawaii. Hawaii. Damn, that's mine too, man. You're the first <laughs> person that said it. I'm like, why is anybody else talking about Hawaii? <laughs> I guess they'd never been there. That's why. Yeah. Last movie you watched. Or series. Um, we're, we're three kids running around. I can't. <laughs> yeah, Trash Truck. I don't know. It's it's a new kids show. I've watched that about <laughs> 10 times this week. <laughs> All right, you sit down at a table to eat and you're going to order anything from anywhere in the world. Any food. What's your go-to meal? Uh, I'll do steak and twice-baked potato. Oh, nice. I haven't heard about twice-baked potatoes in a while. I've been out in Europe for too long. <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's your childhood idol? Um, Carl Malone. Carl Malone, nice. Yeah. Pre-game superstitions? Um, home games. I always have uh, pancakes and eggs. My wife makes, makes them for me. Like pre-meal or breakfast? This is a uh, breakfast. Breakfast? Before okay. seeing around here. All right, so that's that's a must then, huh? Yeah. Tell me one game that if you can go back in time, you would love to replay it and why? Um, it would have to be back in college, being being able to play a, that Sweet 16 game and not being suspended. And not being suspended. I, I kind of figured that might be the one. Yeah. This one might this one might be easier for you to do. Tell me top three year league memories. Um, definitely, uh, Final Four, um, then the eight in a row we had to win to make the playoffs, um, and then we're about to make the third one. Yeah. I was, was going to say, I think you're, I think you're trying to live the third one right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Any plans for when this is finally over? I know you're young, but we always, we always need to think about it. When the game's over and you're all done, and you got three kids running around, what you gonna do with yourself? Yeah, I mean, we've kind of thought about it. We've, uh, my wife's from California. You know, I have, mm. All my family's in Utah, so we've kind of, um, you know, we still got to figure out where where we're gonna live when we're done. We have a house in Utah, but you know, you know, obviously, you know where you're gonna live. Don't try to fool me. You're gonna live in California. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe some, maybe somewhere in the middle, like St. George or something. So where it's always warm. We'll, we, we'll see. <laughs> we know, we know who has the last word in that family. Yeah, it's not, it's not always up to me. So. <laughs> All right, let's get to the trivia question. We'll get you out of here, man. And, and I'll, I'll let you know, each point, you got five questions. Each one is worth 10 more points than the previous one. We start number one with 10 points, then 20, 30, 40, 50, all right? I want all you right. to know our overall leader with only 70 points is your boy, Grigonis. So, okay. So you got a chance to top him. And I think you might be able to do it by looking at these questions. You ready? All right. Here's number one. Who has been recently awarded the 2020-2021 Turkish Airlines EuroLeague Best Defender Trophy? Tavares. Man, that's 10 points for you. Number two, which teams participated in the last Final Four? Worth 20 points. Um... Oh, last year, didn't have it. So the year before was Cheska. One for four. Madrid. Two for four. Fenner. Three for four. And Ephes. Man, four for four, 20 points. Up to 30. Let's go, question number three, we're 30 points. You can put yourself 10 points behind Mario's. How many Final Four appearances has Saris Yasakevich has had? Total Final Four appearances. Four. And six. Two with Barcelona, two with Maccabi, and two with Panathinaikos. Oh, yeah. Number four. Worth 40 points, and this could give you a tie at least. Which FC Barcelona player has played more minutes 
in your league this season. Has played the, the most this season? Which FC Barcelona player has played the had has played more minutes in the Euro League this season? Me? <laughs> no, man, Nick. Nick Galat is yeah. playing. Yeah. Oh, I thought you had it right there. Here's number five. This is gonna be a tough one. Which player has scored more points? Which player has scored more points in a single Final Four game since the year 2000? So what players had scored the most points in a single Final Four game since the year 2000? Let's go with... Spinulis. Nope. Trajan Langdon in 2010 with 32 points against Partizan. A third place game. I would have went with I would have went with Shane right there. But yeah, not about that, but hey my man, let me get you off to practice, man. Hey, I, number one, I just want to thank you. I know there's a, 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 a difficult time for you guys with the final four right around the corner with everything else going around. I want to take, thank you for taking out this hour and, and talking about you. I could have I could have sat down and done this about another 20, 30 minutes. I had so many more questions to ask you, but I know you're, uh, <laughs> I know, I know you're short on time, but I appreciate it. Um, I'll see you in Germany unless I test positive before I leave here <laughs> next week. But um, I'll be there Not commentating cool. the game and hopefully sitting out and interviewing you and putting that mic in your face at one point or another for good news. <laughs> good news. My man, all good right. luck. Good luck next week and, and go do your thing. That's all I can say. Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. All right, Brandon. We'll talk soon, man. All right, see you. Bye.